presentation for tonight. We'll be starting in a few, in one minute. Uh, we were just playing a little bit of relaxing music uh, in these trying times. I think music really is a, a healer for us and helps us in, in these days of stress and um, COVID-19. All right, well, it is six o'clock. And so again, good evening. And thank you all for coming and joining us tonight. Hope you're relaxing and sitting back uh, to learn a little bit about a study and a project that's going on at the School of Nursing that we're very proud of um, and the faculty are so involved in. Um, it's a project that's really impacting um, our undergraduate uh, program in, in many, many ways. Um, so this is the fall alumni presentation and it's the role of the RN in primary care implications for academia and practice. Um, this is a HRSA funded four year experience. And uh, before we get started though, I would like to thank Maria Sharon for all her fine work in setting this up, all the details behind the scene that are necessary to run one of these. So thank you, Maria. And also to the development uh, and the alumni staff, um, Dean Musel, uh, also Dr. Diana Morris and as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and Beverly Caper, the Director of the BSN program and Molly Jackson, the Director of the MN program for without these fine leaders, uh, our project would not be implemented as well as it has been. So thank you for your support. All right, so we're gonna go to the next slide. Uh, and we are showcasing our stellar faculty from the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing who are all part of this amazing work. Uh, but there are many other faculty uh, and staff who have contributed to this project who are not on the call today, uh, but we are grateful for those others and we will have a slide later uh, for the really big team effort in this project. Um, each speaker today will introduce themselves as they share their co uh, component of the presentation. And so next slide. Just a housekeeping slide then. Uh, there are no disclosures or no conflicts of interest for anyone planning or presenting this activity. And the learners, all of you, uh, who listen to the activity will warn, earn one hour, uh, one contact hour. Uh, so at the conclusion, you'll receive a link um, in the chat and also a QR code uh, to access the evaluation. Um, complete and submit it and you'll receive a link to your certificate and do keep that printed or keep your certificate secure for your own records. Next slide. So I would like to, again, uh, recognize the funding for this uh, project from the HRSA, uh, fund HRSA and uh, it was a four-year project, and um, we are really grateful for the ability to have this funding to implement this project. Okay, next slide. And a little polling question. So we would like to learn from you, how familiar are you with the RN in primary care role? Not at all familiar, somewhat familiar, or you work as an RN in primary care. Wow, great. All right, so looks like uh, the polls are mainly in, and so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And so you can all see the results that not familiar at all was about only 5%. And then 75% of you some are familiar and 20% are actual role RNs in primary care. So we'll be very interested to hear from you um, at the end. And if you all want to put questions in the Q&A box or in the chat, um, that would be lovely to share your experiences and any questions you might have. All right. So we're gonna close the poll. Uh-huh, and we'll go to the next slide. And on the next slide, I see. Hold on, let me see if I can get That's okay. There. Okay, <laughs> Yay, that. there we go. So this is an overview of what we'll be talking about today, uh, looking at the RNs in primary care and also our integration of the RN competencies into our curriculum and into a few practices in the city and then also the continuing education uh, and lessons learned that we've developed and learned about. Next slide. So I would like to say though, nurses and registered nurses in primary care make a huge difference. Um, and just a little bit about that RN role in primary care and why the HRSA, fu HRSA funded 43 sites across the United States for a total of $23 million in the last four years. 
Well, there's a huge demand, as we know, for primary care services and an emerging role for services that are um, in the scope of practice for a registered nurse. Things like chronic care management, teaching, care coordination, medication reconciliation. Uh, the registered nurse can contribute in the primary care quite um, intensely. Next slide. And this slide depicts uh, that we do need improvement in our country in primary care. And this is a recent publication this past last week from the Commonwealth Fund indicating that the United States ranked 11th after all these other countries in access to care, care processes, and administ administration efficacy, equity, and healthcare outcomes. And I'm sure, as you're all probably registered nurses, you would agree that RNs can contribute to improving these quality indicators. Next slide. But there are barriers to the RN working at the top of their license in primary care. Uh, barriers today are shown on the left. So if you look at the left of the slide, and these include a limited role for the RN in primary care practices, also restrictions in some states on the role of the RN in primary care, and then our education is really centered on inpatient and acute care in most schools of nursing. Next slide. Uh, but because we are aware of these issues, it started about 2015, there's been many, many uh, publications about this need and uh, this initiative that really helped, I think, HRSA to be motivated to provide this money and needed support to get these 43 sites across the country really test beds for how do we do this? How do we get the RNs in primary care to work to the top of their license? And how do we integrate this new competencies or these competencies into our curriculum? Okay, next slide. So, so you may be wondering, well, how does an RN even function in primary care? Because when I go to the primary care doctor, I just see like an MA and a provider. I don't really see an RN. Well, uh, at the VA um, across the country, since about 2010, uh, they have a new model of care, which is delivered such as a medical home model. They call it in the VA, the PACT model or patient aligned care team, in which the patient co-produces their health with a team. And that team includes a clerk, a provider, a medical assistant, and an RN care manager. And so, uh, next slide. Note that this is sort of a new concept that is moving quite fastly and swiftly in our healthcare primary care sites across the country. Um, and interestingly, I think two days ago, a webinar came through from the primary care collaborative on this exact thing about how do we work interprofessionally in teams in primary care. All right, next slide. So with all this past evidence of the need for registered nurses in primary care, the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing received $2. million grant to move this forward. And so now you're going to hear from our outstanding team how we are doing this at FPB. So Patty, take it away. <laughs> Rita? Yep. Sorry, I'll take it, it's Rita. Oh, Rita, okay. sorry. <laughs> just, just a little insert here about the state of the RN practice in primary care currently. Um, we need to start educating our, our nursing students so that they're ready to graduate and work in primary care. Right now, there's very few nurses that are entering primary care practice before the age of 40. It's, it's true to say that a lot of nurses are entering primary care in their last few years of their nursing career. So it's just, we have to figure out a way to get these students graduated, ready to jump into primary care. Go ahead, Patty. Hi, I'm Patty Barant. I'm the project manager for the Enrich HRSA grant. And currently what's occurring in academia is that ambulatory care nursing curriculum is often limited in the pre-licensure nursing programs. The issue poses a serious potential shortfall of BSN prepared RNs equipped to work in primary care settings. So with that in mind, the Enrich HRSA grant was created. Enrich stands for Enhancing Nurse Roles in Community Health undergraduate and workforce training and education in primary care. As Mary spoke of earlier, this is our grant team um, with a couple of omissions here that need to be fixed, but I will <laughs> add those. Um, but our grant team has been working within Case Western Reserve University, the Lewis Stokes Cleveland VA Medical Center and the VA community-based outpatient clinics and the Neighborhood Family Practice, which is a federally qualified health center with seven locations. And then finally, the grant uh, objectives are as follows. Goal one, 
recruit and integrate the BSN students into community-based clinics to enhance RN primary care competency. Our second goal was to enhance staff RN competence in the expanded role of the RN in primary care to prepare RN preceptors to teach and role model working at the top of the RN license. Goal three was to improve and expand the teamwork and collaboration to include all learners. And then finally, goal four was to enhance the existing BSN curriculum, student competence, and faculty competence on the expanded role of the RN in primary care at the Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing. Back to you, Rita. Okay, so I'm Rita Svilavoy and I am faculty here at um, FPB and an alumni. And um, working with the HRSA grant, one of my um, first primary responsibilities were to come up with some, um, to research and find out and develop primary care competencies. So for a nurse that is in primary care, working to the top of their license, they're providing things like holistic, integrated, accessible, and equitable care. They're managing transition of care. Um, you know, it's, some of our, our students are surprised to realize that care actually is, goes on outside of the acute care setting or outside of the hospital. Primary care has the responsibility of managing this as they go home, as they go to nursing homes, as they go to skilled facilities, um, into a group home, wherever they might be going. They should be able to competently care for chronic disease. Um, some, some of the common obesity, hypertension, some of the common um, chronic diseases. And through this, we talk about health promotion, patient education, medication, immunization, administration. Of course, telehealth that we're all, um, you know, much more aware of. Uh, triage in the patient and also um, supervising the unlicensed personnel. Next slide. So competencies and, and um, working at the top of your license. The very last um, line of the, the prior slide was supervision of unlicensed personnel. working at the top of their license. So they're not adding any value. They need not any value added care. They need to learn how to work to the top of their license and be able to supervise the unlicensed personnel. So I went through um, publications looking for primary care competencies and we found no publications. So we took a look at what we thought would be um, pertinent and the American Association of Ambulatory Care Nurses put out the Ambulatory Care Coordination and Transition Competencies. We also looked at the scope and standard of practice for professional ambulatory care nurses. And finally, we took the framework um, from the VA Center of Excellence in Primary Care Education. They have a nurse um, practitioner residency competency. So we kind of use that framework as model when we were developing our competencies. Next slide. So the um, competency development, what we did is who, what, who we are, our primary care leaders, um, staff that work in primary care, and some of our students that were working in primary care. So when we looked at that first um, publication about care coordination and transition management competencies that were put out by the AACN, we found nine dimensions. Some of their dimensions included education and engagement, coaching and counseling, teamwork and collaborating. Then we went on to the scope and standard of practice for professional ambulatory care nurses. And we found that they had um, six dimensions. They talked about protection and promoting health, preventing illness and injury were a couple of their dimensions. And then finally, we went on to the um, VA um, competencies for the nurse practitioner framework. And they had um, seven dimensions that included clinicals, leadership, patient-centered care, shared decision-making were a couple of the, their dimensions. So we clustered all this together. We looked for similarities, we charted it, we put similarities together. We looked at um, things that we really felt were important to be in the um, competencies for primary care. This went through six revisions until we finally came up with 100% agreement. And next slide. That might be a little bit a poor connection. So the, um, the competencies came up 
with, um, we have eight dimensions on the spinal um, primary care competencies. They included um, clinical competencies in planning and managing care. And this included not only physically assessing a patient, but also assessing their educational needs, looking at their knowledge level, looking at their health literacy level. Then we moved on to um, able to provide self-management, health promotion, and chronic care strategies for chronic diseases. You heard a lot of those words when I was talking about the review of the, um, of the prior um, competencies that we, that we saw. Those were included in our um, primary care competencies. We looked at um, leadership and the ability for these students to be able to lead a team huddle, for these students to be able to give and receive um, reports. We moved on to interprofessional collaboration and communication so that the students could actually clearly explain the RN role and responsibilities to patients and families and other professionals. They needed to be able to clearly understand their role and responsibility in order to be competent in, on their primary care company and primary care. We looked at um, patient-centered care. Of course, we bring the um, patient to the center. We communicate with the patient. We coordinate the um, need, whether it be post-hospitalization, prior to hospitalization, whatever their need be. We look, um, we use motivational interview. We teach them how to track and identify um, the needs of the patient. We moved on to our sixth dimension was shared decision-making, um, facilitate patients' participation in healthcare decision-making, engage the patient as a care team member, we talked about um, dimension number seven, sustain relationships, and be sure that the students were able to have relationships with their peers, with the interprofessional team, with their mentors, and of course, with the patients and the families. And our final um, competency was quality improvement and population health. Can the, can the student access and interpret clinical outcomes? Can they improve their system care delivery? So um, with Next slide. Our next slide is a picture of actually one of our um, students in primary care practice. And next slide. And so now Shannon will talk about how we are able to integrate into curriculum and practice these primary care competencies. Hi, I'm Shannon Wall. I a course coordinator for our community health classes. Um, so just to give a little background about our current curriculum um, that exists now and prior to the HRSA grant, we teach community health courses in five semesters. So the students in their second year of their first year, I mean, the second semester of their first year, we start to um, enroll in community health courses and they take one every semester until their fourth year when they take one semester in their senior year. And it's a capstone that focuses on population and community health. All of these courses introduce concepts of healthcare needs in the community while also integrating concepts of primary care and public health, along with um, the, the, while the students are learning concepts in the classroom, we send them out into the community to practice these concepts with experiential learning in a community setting or an outpatient setting, depending on the environment and the year of the student. Next slide. So using the current curricular template that we had in place, um, we recognized that our community courses were prime for enhancements and they, with fueled by the HRSA grant, our team evaluated ways to enhance the primary care concepts and experiences within these courses. So just to give you a little bit more background, these are our students kind of out in the community. The first picture is our students at the Norm Norma Air Women's Center um, for their first year and their introduction to community healthcare in the community. Uh, we bring them into an environment where they just interact and look at the needs of a community. Um, and then with the healthcare in the community, they sort of create some kind of intervention that they're able to provide to the community that they're sent to. Um, with this, we've also enhanced the course by adding poverty simulations so that they can focus more on the social determinants of health. And we offer them an opportunity to learn from the FPB team and the HRSA team that created a video introducing primary care and how primary care interacts in at FPB. 
Um, in the second year, our students have two courses. One is teaching and learning in the community and the other is evidence-based policy in the community. They go into um, some local schools. They do health education lessons using the national health education standards that are guidelines from the CDC um, and interacting with health policies, how they affect the patients and the people that they're caring for, as well as nurses and how policy affects the um, nursing profession. So next slide. Um, our third and fourth year, our students this year um, with the introduction of all of the COVID vaccinations, we are able to change and bring them into our community giving out um, uh, vaccines to millions of people throughout the city of Cleveland. We were with, we worked with the um, Case Western team. We worked with the um, health departments, both the Cleveland and the Cuyahoga Board of Health. And we also worked with neighborhood family practice as Patty had mentioned before. So our students um, in the leadership course, they were sort of tasked with leading younger students and some some PA students in organizing and helping organize the clinics. And it was really a great opportunity for them to use leadership models that they taught in the classroom. We also added to their third year, uh, motivational interviewing and disaster simulation, noting that those were both important things that um, were not in our curriculum. And so we added those to our third year. And then our fourth year students, um, and take two classes, healthcare in the global community, and then their population health practicum capstone program. And that is, we've increased the number of students that go into primary care for a total of 49 students this past year. 22 were in primary care and 27 were in ambulatory care settings. Colleen. Okay, so as you can probably see, I am actually on the floor unit right now. I am supposed to be, I'm taking my, my dinner break. I have uh, students on the floor. So <laughs> I will be, as soon as I'm done here, I will be taking them back to the floor. Um, but I will be discussing the general educational um, nursing requirements for the freshman, sophomore, and junior and senior items that. Uh, we have decided to integrate some of the primary care items into. Um, in the freshman years, we are integrating more of the primary care into how we deal with the patients uh, from the more uh, mental health standpoint, including by um, behavioral health uh, integration uh, through simulations. Uh, either via um, interviewing standardized patients, which we are hoping to do um, very soon. Also by uh, the shadow health uh, program simulations with the anxiety module that it provides so that the students can also not only explore their own feelings, but explore the feelings of the patients so that they can explore how to talk to somebody who is feeling anxiety and actually provide more understanding when they go in and deal with the patient on the floor so that they learn how to interview patients more appropriately. Um, we also started with the telehealth uh, modules that we are starting to introduce every year. This past year, we had the telehealth module that we are introducing to all the levels including also a COVID um, education portion there. And uh, we are going to bring that forward every year from here on out, starting in the freshman year. Next slide, please. And in the sophomore year, which is where I reside, uh, this is our sophomore year. This is the uh, nursing care of the adult, our medication, a medical surgical unit. Um, and this is a two semester course. It is also the biggest uh, portion of our curriculum uh, and the hardest one they, they like to tell me. And that's the one I am course coordinator for currently. And we are in the throes of inpatient care most of the time. So in the first semester, what we do is we start in the post-conferences and pre-conferences talking about the role of the nurse in the primary care and how we want to increase the knowledge of primary care and how the nurse can influence the patient's 
care in the primary care setting and how we can transition from inpatient to outpatient care and prevent readmission that way. So when we discharge a patient, we are preventing their readmission and caring for the patient outside the hospital setting more readily and more appropriately. We are also preparing them for more of a transitional thought process. So we also introduce them to the, uh, the care planners, the care coordinators that are on the floor as well. Um, in the second semester, we provide experiences in the primary care setting. Um, Last year and the year before, we did pilot experiences, uh, one day experiences where they would go into an outpatient care setting. Um, the first year we had uh, 10 students that went to a primary care setting in our um, general internal medicine uh, unit downstairs in G100 at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, just a general, you know, just meeting the patients as they came in. Last year, we had 21 students that met the dermatological nurses in the outpatient clinics and the hepatology unit. That was an outpatient unit at the Cleveland Clinic. This year, we're going to have all the students, all 70 of them go through an outpatient experience, at least one day per student. Um, we are already in the process of talking to Carolyn Coffin about those experiences for next semester. So we can at least have one day where they see how that outpatient and follow-up occurs. Um, the students also write up a reflection of those experiences, how they were able to, to provide that care with the nurses and collaborate with the team and what they saw while they were there. Next uh, slide, please. As the sophomores progress, they also deal with shadow health again and uh, deal with behavioral health simulations for inpatient, outpatient, and community care in the behavioral health course, which is our psychology and psychiatric needs course. This also includes some veteran care and PTSD needs and therapeutic communication modules with practice with simulation that increases their confidence in patient care and interviewing. Next slide, please. As they progress again, they move into the junior year and they have pediatric and OB-GYN classes. Uh, in the pediatrics, they have had time and uh, time on the units, or excuse me, at the Head Start and the Cleveland Metropolitan School District normally uh, during the pandemic that has backed off. However, they have had uh, primary care clinic placements during their low census on the floors so that when they have not been able to be as at inpatient settings, they have been in primary care. So there is that possibility and that experience that has been going on um, as they continue on into 373, which is our uh, more of our global health uh, units, they are going into primary care clinic placements. And then we have telehealth modules and quality improvement uh, units throughout and QSIN as well that we have been trying to emphasize throughout the entire curriculum from beginning to end in all of our pre-licensure programs. In the uh, pediatric uh, unit as well, they have had simulations of the lead screenings which we hope to go back to in reality as soon as possible. It's just been hard to do during the pandemic, but we hope to get back to that. Next slide, please. Uh, the transition of care that we emphasize is very important, uh, especially when it comes to pharmacologic needs. Uh, medication reconciliations are, are emphasized throughout the entire curriculum throughout the entire program. Quality improvement is a very essential part of everything we do. We try to incorporate those items that we've already had and assess that constantly. So we continue to use ADPI and the nursing process to improve upon what we already have to just increase our primary care into the curriculum. And now, next slide, please. 
we Hi. are moving on to Becky. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Rebecca Mitchell. I'm the project liaison for the uh, Enriched Versa grant. And I do a lot of supporting, engaging, facilitating, just exactly what you would think a liaison would do. Um, so as Colleen was talking, I can tell you that most of the grant team was involved in supporting um, primary care integration, just as Colleen and Shannon and Rita were talking about. We also work with preceptors at different facilities um, to help them out. Um, some of the, our smaller facilities don't have dedicated education units or preceptor programs. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. I also try to engage nursing staff who are already working in primary care clinical sites. And we work with the VA at both their Wade Park facility, Women's Health, and then we are also out at the community-based outpatient clinics. Um, and that's a recent development for us. I know somebody asked about how we get primary care sites. We'll talk more about that later. We're also at Neighborhood Family Practice. Um, and sorry, I didn't spell it out. NFP is Neighborhood Family Practice. They have seven locations. Um, and we're engaged with them in some projects. I also facilitate nursing students through the Enriched Fellowship. We have um, various numbers of students who sign on to do some extra work in primary care. And again, I'll talk about a little bit about that. Next slide, please, please. So practice integration includes those preceptors. Um, but along with preceptors, I'd like you to kind of widen your vision a little bit to include clinical instructors or new clinical instructors, people who we hire who may not have had that experience in the past. And so some of our preceptor training can also be applied to new clinical instructors. So we do support clinical instructors um, and orientation for the preceptors or with preceptors. We have developed a preceptor handbook, which I am sure we would share with anybody who wanted that. Um, we also provide resources and guidance uh, for preceptors, and we actually um, developed quite a few things, including uh, telehealth references and modules, um, some tip sheets and some coaching, and we did some uh, learning opportunities um, for them also. Um, all of these opportunities, like I said, are also open to the clinical instructors or faculty. Next slide, please. Specific to the preceptors, we developed, um, this is Barb Tassel and I developed a series of nine modules um, that we did live the first time. They were half hour modules put together. Um, you can see some of the titles there. Um, when we did them live, we didn't have a, a lot of nurse some because we did it for a very small population. We did it for neighborhood family practice. They only had two or three preceptors and those preceptors would come on. Since then, we have actually audio taped and videotaped those and produced them, attached CEs to them. And there were CEs originally too. Um, so CEs are attached to, so we have about four and a half hours of CE attached to these nine modules. And they include the adult learning principles, appreciative um, diversity, things that you see there, um, formative and summative feedback. We also went into Benner's professional model developing critical and clinical thinking. And then we also did a, a crucial conversations, which had a little bit of a bent, um, looking at difficult conversations that preceptors might have with their preceptees, as well as their healthcare colleagues. Um, those nine modules have been rolled out to the Cleveland area, but we also have Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi using them. And some of those modules have been viewed up to 196 times, I think was the last time. So we might be at 200 by now. Next slide. We also, um, I'm also working with these fellows. Um, we call them Enriched Fellows or the Enriched Fellowship. They need 150 hours of clinical time in primary care. The two sites that we're sending students to, um, you saw in one of the last slides, um, are the VA and Neighborhood Family Practice. Through the VA, we were able to um, get space in women's health this semester, as well as three different community-based outpatient clinics at Lake Lorraine and also Parma. Um, the Enriched Fellows have various opportunities, and these opportunities were set up in order to help them understand the practice of the RN in primary care and the resources that they have. Um, available to them to connect their patients to when they would talk to them in primary care. Um, and so some of those things include um, 
the community resources like food banks or hot meal sites. Um, and I really encourage them to go understand the people that are there so that they can talk to people in primary care or wherever they end up practicing nursing about that experience of asking for help um, or um, seeing what that experience is like so they can, can describe it to the patient because if they can describe it to the patient and they know how to tell the patient how to access it, it will be easier for the patient to take that step. And that's um, certainly... Um, comes out when you think about support group meetings, whether it's Alcoholics Anonymous or Emotions Anonymous or um, any other addictive support, uh, support groups, or they could be disease support groups um, or, or chronic disease management support groups. Um, I skipped over the interprofessional learning, but at the VA, they have something called the Center of Excellence and they have a residency program where they have interprofessional learning that includes not only the residents, but NP students, and residents, as well as social work, pharm pharmacy, and then we are the RN component to that. Um, and that's been really useful for the students to see. These students have also participated in the Houston conference and produced posters and, and um, spoken at those conferences as well as attended conferences. They've also done some learning modules. And those learning modules, again, are specifically geared towards primary care. Um, care transitions um, modules, uh, caring of the aging family modules, chronic disease management, population health management, behavioral mental health and substance abuse modules. Um, so just a variety of things, there are more, but we're kind of time limited tonight. So next slide. So working to the top of their license, um, we teach the students what the role of the nurse is in primary care based on competencies and the law, the scope of practice. Um, but what does that really look like at the facilities that we're at? Um, people learned, like we all learned, in the inpatient setting. And so by the time they're 40 um, and, and got in, like the, you know, the average age of getting into primary care, we don't always know exactly what top of license means or looks like. And so we try to role model that as well as talk to the RNs in those settings um, ab about that issue of doing um, work that is value added on top of, of the license. So one of the things we did at the VA was we actually did a hypertension panel management project and we produced in the end a hypertension uh, management handbook. And that was between, uh, it, we worked with those PAC teams, um, the clerks, the RNs, the LPNs and the physician um, and the RNs and the physician were the main ones that contributed to the handbook. And then the RNs um, ended up producing posters for both QCIN and ACN conferences that talked about their experience of being coached as part of a team to manage hypertension. And their hypertension out of target range patients changed about 10 to 15% of more people on target after this project. We also work with telehealth or VA video connect training. We have the students do that each semester. We also invite the LPNs and the RNs to come along for a refresher um, in that training um, and work to, together to see what those uh, visits are like. We also did some team building things, including some all staff um, sessions. One was on implicit bias. We also did a quality improvement um, project or, or um, seminar, which lasted about a month. Dr. Delansky um, graciously hosted that. And we had people from the clerks as well as LPNs and RNs um, come into that, that setting. And that's really good because the next thing I'm gonna tell you about, next slide please, um, is an initiative that we call the Avengers. The group chose the name. Avengers were big at that time about two years ago and they still are. So um, it was good that, that the clerks and the LPNs and the RNs went to that quality improvement um, seminar because what the Avengers are trying to do after an assessment of their area in, at Wade Park Primary Care is to get those frontline people to use quality improvement strategies to facilitate change and know that they can be empowered to make change. Um, and the, our current project right now is role clarity and standardization of role within that PAC team, patient aligned care team. And the reason that's important is because some of them cross cover um, and we're adding safety and um, quality outcomes um, to the team by having some role clarification um, and standardization. 
And like I said, we're empowering them um, to have um, some collaboration. In this case, collaboration across silos. Many times um, administrators of the clerks, the LPNs and the physicians are different people. And they become sometimes siloed in their policies and there's not always crosstalk. So um, with this Avengers team, we've been able to empower these teams to start talking. They actually started an interprofessional chat and are doing some problem solving on their own um, away from administration, which I think is a huge step forward for the team. Um, and they're also practicing team leadership and doing those things. Um, next slide, please. So at Neighborhood Family Practice, what are we doing? Actually, this is a very new collaboration. We started with them about a year ago. Um, they had, do have those seven locations. And I already talked about the preceptor series. This is a group, it's a federally qualified health center. They have no um, education department. They don't have somebody that's um, in charge of education. Um, I, you know, they have somebody who checks off the box, um, but to develop something new and different um, they really don't have the time or the resources to do that. So we were happy to do that. Um, and like I said, that was a huge success for them. They do continue to use those um, to train their preceptors. Um, the RNs in this case manage individual clinics. They do not work as part of a predefined team. The RNs here manage clinics. Most of the, the patients who are doing the um, rooming of patients and taking of vital signs, those tasks we think of are being done by MAs at the clinic who are managed by the RNs. Um, the RNs are doing a lot of outreach and seeing their own patient groups um, and, and then you know, referring back to their physicians. Next slide, please. Um, in the spring of 21, um, one of the outreach programs um, that was on the last slide, one of the outreach programs that started was because of the enriched nursing fellows that were at neighborhood family practice. And what they did was they did a, a screening and developed a screening tool um, for hypertension and diabetes risk. So pre-hypertension, pre-diabetes, what are your risk factors? The, the neighborhood family practice group liked it so much, they wanted to continue that and we're actually doing that only with diabetes, pre-diabetes screening um, this semester. They actually text the patient in their, their native language, ask them to fill out a survey. That survey comes back to neighborhood family practice. And because of space issues, we're actually doing telehealth offsite on CASES campus, um, but with neighborhood family practices patient group. Um, all through secure messaging, encrypted messaging, we have access to their health record. Um, and so we are making this happen um, with two students, uh, and again, and Rich Fellows this semester, who have really done a phenomenal job in working out the process map, um, helping work out the kinks with the people who are working at Neighborhood Family Practice, and interfacing with that pre-diabetes prevention program that um, GEMCARE, which the neighborhood family practice hired, it's a free service though to patients, um, to get them into that clinic and order the blood work they need and order the return visit to their primary care physician to close the loop, to get those people who are at risk for diabetes back into to the care they need. Um, next slide. These are some thoughts about the Enriched Fellows. I will not read them. I'm gonna guess we're gonna send the um, PowerPoint out to you. And so now I am going to turn this all over to, I believe, Dr. Barb Tassel, who's gonna share information about our professional development activities. Thank you, Becky. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, I'm Barb Tassel and my uh, background is in professional development, which includes CE and educational design and competency. And I'm sure that you've heard the term competency many, many times so far today. Um, but I've also would assume that you've heard a lot of topics that could be brand new to students, to faculty, um, and even some to the practicing nurses. So that all falls under the professional development needs. and. Um, so one of the questions that we've had to ask and answer a lot of times is who out of all these folks need professional development needs, faculty, students, and practicing nurses. 
And we've kind of come to the conclusion that typically in about every topic we touch, they all need some form of professional development. So we've gotten real agile with that, real flexible with how we do that and how we offer it. And I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of the framework that we've built to provide all these different topics to different levels of practitioners. Um, and we keep learning what people need. Um, how we've done that is there was some initial assessment surveys that were used at all the sites that you've heard, including the faculty and the practicing nurses and the student level. Uh, we have a lot of anecdotal reports. We've had a lot of people talk today and the group is bigger than those of us on the call today. So there's been a lot of opportunity for anecdotal reports coming back saying, oh, they didn't know this or they need more information about this or did you hear this is changing? And so we've kept progressing as the grant has gone on. Um, and we've really seen, uh, it's not a practice gap, it's a true developmental gap based on this emerging role that keeps developing even over the four years of the grant. So next slide, please. So some of the topics, and there's really, you've heard a lot about this already, um, but some of the topics we have specifically developed, uh, probably the foundational one would be the emerging role of the RN in primary care. People really don't understand what this emerging role is about. And so that's probably one of the core pieces of the content we've put together. Also uh, legal considerations for RNs working in primary care. Telehealth that you've heard uh, in several areas, we built uh, an entire four module course on telehealth. It takes about two hours to complete it. So it's, it's pretty robust. Um, preceptor development series that was mentioned. We're working right now on panel management, motivational interviewing, and those modules will be done shortly. We're also working with a lot of our community partners on an ambulatory nursing review course uh, for certification and to update people on current trends and this emerging role. Um, that course alone is going to have about 40 some modules within it. Uh, so it's a very robust uh, review course that we're building, um, free to the nurses that will attend. Um, and I think we can give you that link also. I'm not sure we have it in our, uh, our slide set, but we can definitely give you the link to register for those of you who were working in primary care, if that's something that you would like. And then another unique um, professional development activity that we built and I think accidentally found a gold mine in was a virtual care, a virtual career fair that we, um, uh, Becky worked hard and enabled the students to go into primary care settings to reflect on that, do some interviews, um, pull information out, and then other students had a real professional development opportunity to watch that video material, and we have that now available for faculty to use in future um, education. So again, one starting point has become just a goldmine of information that can be used over time. Uh, so next slide, please. So how did we deploy all of this? That was probably one of the biggest um, puzzles that we had to put together. And so we actually are running three different um, uh, learning management systems uh, in Canvas. We have a faculty development site developed with CE for all these topics. Sometimes that has extra help in it, sometimes not. We have student courses that we run in a variety of ways on Canvas. And then um, CASE also has a public facing Canvas site. And we have a couple of our modules available on those. Um, we are using the um, QSIN webpage to deliver a lot of the content that can be delivered just on a web page. So it depends on how the content is built, how we can actually do that. Um, and then we're, ac we're actually running a separate LMS called iSpring for our review course. Again, it depends on the target audience and how you wanna use it. So we're, we're finding that we're using all three of these. Uh, next slide, please. So we have, in, in looking at all these professional development needs, seen a wide variety of learning needs from the, those three target audiences. So we've tried real hard to put continuing education credit with as much of it as we can. We have 18 uh, CE activities currently and have had over 1,000 completions of those in the last 12 months. Um, those modalities include articles that we've put CE with, uh, the learning modules that you've heard, just video format, webinars, we've done a live lunch and learn session for faculty development. So we really have tried to use different uh, learning modalities to reach different people's learning styles. And again, then that kind of goes into that deployment and how do you share that past the, the initial audience. And I think Becky had one of the best examples we had a very small target audience that needed that learning management, or I'm sorry, that preceptor development. And we kind of had anticipated that we would use it elsewhere. So we, we um, videotaped, audio taped it. And now those are very widely um, used, uh, like 
like Becky described. So next slide, please. Thanks, uh, Mary, for sharing that link. Um, so the a little bit more about the ambulatory certification course that Mary just shared the link with, uh, heavy focus on top of license, and I'm sure you've picked up on that, that, that is a, a big component of this grant. We are offering asynchronous guided learning. It will start in just about three short weeks um, and run through January for the guided component, and then they will still have access to the content until about mid-April. Um, for studying. Again, we have about 40 topics. We have experts from most of the community, large community um, entities and, and a lot of folks from uh, CASE as well. And we're recording about 40 different topics, adding additional resources. We'll be offering live Q&A panel sessions uh, to go with those, kind of timed in that, in that uh, several month session. Um, and then we'll also have a collection of practice questions and review sessions at the very end of the live component. Um, and again, we've had real good um, community partner support in building this, but we're also reaching out for our target audience to the smaller clinics in Northeast Ohio and to the local schools of nursing, because we think that this would be a great opportunity for graduating seniors um, and also for you know, nurses who want to return to uh, practice in some way, shape or form uh, and nurses in a graduate program. So we, we think that that's a good, good target area for them. So next slide, please. And I've given you some of the links here and we will be sharing the, um, uh, the slide deck with you is my understanding. So uh, if you're interested in looking at the telehealth slides, um, there is a free code available right now for that course. And so that's on the slide, the legal considerations. Uh, again, it also has a, I think that one has a low cost to it. If you've not done your law yet for this year, it meets the category A law requirement. And then our preceptor modules uh, and the role of the RN, the emerging role of the RN in primary care is uh, posted there on the QSIN website. Again, over five hours total in those 10 modules that are out there. Um, so if you, um, yeah, code's there, good. So I think that's the end of my section and I'm handing it off now to Marianne to talk about evaluation. Thank you, Barb. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Ann Lawler, and I'm a recent um, PhD graduate from the FPV School of Nursing, and I'm also the data manager for the HRSA grant. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, data will be summarized by focus group to include faculty, staff RNs, and students. Um, in, on this slide, in 2019, 48 faculty at FPB were asked to complete a survey based on educational needs and opportunities. Um, 19 faculty completed this survey and the results are shown here. Topics are organized by interest level and topics were, um, that were found to be the greatest interest to staff, including requests for additional information, include telehealth, motivational interviewing, leading a team, uh, the patient-centered medical home model, querying registries, managing disagreements, and the use of the PDSA cycle within QI to deliver care. Um, this assessment will be sent again to the staff this coming semester. Uh, next slide, please. In May of 2021, staff RNs at the VA um, were given this survey to gauge their perceived role, happiness at work, and educational needs within their current position. The graph below summarizes the responses of these seven RNs. Um, topics on the bottom left were those that staff RNs identified as having little to no interest in um, having additional information given, uh, while the topics on the top right were those that staff RNs identified as being significantly um, interested in learning more about. Topics where the staff RNs were most interested include precepting coaching, legal issues in primary care, chronic disease prevention and management, and professional and leadership roles within primary care. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then finally, three cohorts of the Enrich Fellows have gone through the study so far, um, and they were given a series of surveys over four time points throughout their fellowship to gauge things such as competency, attitude, knowledge, and nursing skill comfort level and practice. The results from these surveys um, are far too vast to cover in just this presentation. However, to briefly summarize, um, one survey was related to the fellow's knowledge and use of skills in practice. The survey, the SEPSS, was comprised of 36 two-part questions. Um, part one asked fellows um, what their perceived ability to complete a task was, and part two asked how often they actually use this skill in practice. 
Um, the following topics were found to be areas where fellows indicated rarely or never using the skill in practice. These include things such as asking the patient about how he can share his emotions about the chronic condition with others, discussing with the patient who they will inform about their chronic condition, facilitating um, the patient to easily stay in contact between appointments, initiating contact between appointments with the patient to discuss and solve difficulties. Um, and so moving forward, we will continue to collect these surveys throughout the remainder of the HRSA time study. Next slide. So I'd like to um, pass the baton back to Mary for a summary and closing remarks. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much, team. This was an amazing presentation uh, sharing this work that has impacted our curriculum at the School of Nursing and also the primary care sites where the registered nurses are working. I would like to open up to a few questions that have emerged, and I'm so delighted to see that we do have some primary care nurses on, the, on this webinar. Um, and uh, one question was, do we have trouble finding primary care sites for the students? So if anybody could answer that question, it would be great. Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, so I talked to Dr. Esther Bernhofer, who coordinates uh, Nursing 373, and in her group of placing, I think we've got 49 or 50, she said at least a third of her places are primary or ambulatory care settings. I can tell you as the liaison, uh, when I stepped in, we had only Wade Park primary care um, as an option for the fellows um, at that time um, to go for for a primary care setting and get their 150 clinical hours. We have since expanded to neighborhood family practice. That took a little bit of work. We probably spent a year kind of talking back and forth between before we finally put somebody in that setting. I think um, the community-based outpatient clinics for the VA uh, were along the same timeline. We started about a year ago and we finally got them in there. Some of that I think was um, slowed down by COVID and space issues. Um, I do think it is a little more difficult to find primary care because they're not quite sure what the student's going to do there. And I think one of the things we need to move away from is, is that nursing is thinking as well as doing, and nursing can actually um, maybe have a little bit better time thinking about all of the things um, that need to happen long term for chronic disease management and those types of things in the primary care setting. And those skills are transferable to any setting. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question was, I believe um, my years of experience as a bedside nurse in acute care were essential to the success as an RN manager in primary care. It may be difficult uh, for a brand new grad or RN to function in this role without that bedside acute care setting. Can any of y'all comment on that? I hate to be the one that talks all the time, but if you want me to answer that, I can. Although Shannon unmuted. Shannon, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to um, mention that I, I'm not sure. Like, I think we're working towards training our students to be ready. I do know that we have worked with some partners who have um, taken, oh, sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> um, who have taken away their restrictive um, hiring processes that mean that they are willing and open to working with and training new grads. So I think it's a mindset that we need to um, open ourselves up to and we are together trying to do our part in opening up our students' mindsets that nurses practice in many places, not just inside of a hospital. So I I think there is a shift, and but I, I do agree that you can't take the years of experience, but um, Maybe as you know, healthcare is changing so much right now that maybe we can, you know, shift that those are the year the types of experiences that are preparing you solely um, are so important and they've been so important to all of us. But I don't. I'm not sure I'm meant. I'm not sure I'm saying that exactly as I would. <laughs> well, I think that's important. And too, we heard that a lot actually when this started. But our, our intention is to measure competencies and to demonstrate that the you know new graduates can come out with the competencies that are needed for ambulatory care. So I think we'll be seeing more and more of evidence that 
they can transition to the primary care setting with residency programs. One last question was, uh, do nursing students feel intimidated by the primary care setting? Um, as home care, I see the setting as one that would require nursing experience. That's a really good question because we really have identified as a team that when you're doing care in primary care or home care, you're really there um, delivering, you know, very um, important nursing functions um, that are so important um, to to care delivery. But anybody else have any other thoughts on that question? I, I think experiential learning is is valued in any setting. So whether it's the acute care where they get their experience or home care or primary care, obviously those care delivery modalities have to accommodate the, the novice learner. We have to have models in place. And I think some of those changes in um, in those restrictive hiring, are, we're gonna we're gonna now see what those changes in place and the need for RNs as we move our our new grads into those areas. We're gonna see some ways develop that will allow those folks to gain that experience and confidence that comes with it. Yeah. So it is at the top of the hour. Um, we are just so grateful that you all came hey. on tonight. Oh yes. Was there another question? Oh, I did copy the link. So this is Rita, and I think oh. that a good. Go ahead. A good closing comment, I think, is that, you know, we talk about the students and are they capable of doing this? And obviously, like everybody's saying, is that we want to teach them the competencies. The students are also um, becoming aware of this. Um, I think I've shared with everybody here the example of the student that um, went to the East Coast to a teaching hospital for an internship in her junior year. And she was gun ho that she was going to be a critical care pediatric nurse. She came back to me at the start of her senior year and said, I, as much as I love the experience, I have decided that I'm going primary care because I saw just way too many things that could have been prevented. And so, you know, students are buying into it and she wanted to um, move into this. Great. Thanks for sharing that story, Rita. Very important to end that way with the positivity of the new grads and the new generation coming through. So, Patty, if you could slip to the next slide. The QR code is there if you want to use your phone to step into the evaluation or it's also in the chat. So please fill out the evaluation so you can claim your co contact hours. And uh, again, thank you to this wonderful panel and all the hard work that you all have done. And thank you to all alum who have come on to this session to learn more about what we're doing at FPB. Um, it's a great place and we are glad to uh, have a little bit of time to spend with you tonight. So have a, a very enjoyable evening um, and thank you again. Good night, everyone.